Hello students, welcome back and today we are going to continue our discussion on chemical equilibrium and the topic of this lecture is numerical problems on chemical equilibrium. So, the first problem that I want to tell you about is as follows. The question is write the expression of equilibrium constant for the chemical reaction highlighted here. So, what is this chemical reaction? I have 3 moles of solid iron reacting with 4 moles of water vapor giving rise to Fe3O4 solid and releasing 4 moles of hydrogen gas. So, how do I follow the convention of thermodynamics and write down the expression for equilibrium constant for this reaction? I know that the first step would be recasting or rewriting the balanced chemical equation in the form of an algebraic equation like this. Okay? So, in this case I identify that J, J is the Jth component in the equilibrium mixture. So, uh, I, how many components do I have in the equilibrium mixture? I have 4 components. So, I, I need to understand that I will look for a form uh, an algebraic form of the equation like this, identify the 4 uh, components here, identify the stoichiometric coefficients of each component in the balanced algebraic equation. So, this is what I do. I rewrite this equation in the form of this algebraic equation. So, now what do I have? I have this is my j equal to 1. So, Fe3O4 solid that represents the first component in my equilibrium mixture and what is the uh, coefficient stoichiometric coefficient uh, for this component that is plus 1. Next we see that I have the next component for J equal to 2 the hydrogen gas and what is the coefficient here? The coefficient here is plus 4. So, nu 2 in this representation is plus 4 and then I have the third component corresponding to j equal to 3 with nu 3 equal to minus 3. Now, what does it tell you? It tells you immediately by the convention that I am following in writing down this algebraic equation, iron solid is a reactant in this reaction. If you compare it with either hydrogen or Fe3O4, I find that their coefficients are positive. So, I know that by convention we write down this equation in such a way that the stoichiometric coefficients of rea uh, reactants are negative and products are positive. Therefore, it does not come as a surprise that for J equal to 4, the last component of the equilibrium mixture is water vapor and its coefficient is minus 4. So, what I have done is I have written down this information in the form of a table where I have identified as the first component xj is Fe3O4 correspondingly nu j is plus 1, j equal to 2 gives me xj equal to hydrogen gas and its nu j is plus 4. Similarly, nu 3 is minus 3 and nu 4 is minus 4. Now, I, once again let me remind you that the positive sign associated with the stoichiometric coefficient in the balanced algebraic chemical equation corresponds to products of the reaction and negative stoichiometric coefficients as shown here in this balanced algebraic equation correspond to reactants. Now, I will go ahead and use this information to write down the equilibrium constant and I know that by definition 
if I have some uh, uh, species uh, here in this case J going from 1 to 4 in the equilibrium chemical mixture, then K is product of activities of each such component raised to the power of its stoichiometric coefficient nu j and this should be evaluated at equilibrium. Therefore, in this case what I will do is I will try and rewrite this expression using the table that I have come up with and please note that since I am using the definition, the general definition of activity here, therefore, k by definition is a dimensionless quantity. Now, so the first thing that I write down, I write down the first term for j equal to 1. So, that would be activity of Fe3O4 solid raised to the power of plus 1. I will then write down the second term in this multiplication as activity of hydrogen gas raised to the power of plus 4. Then I have the third term which is coming here as the activity of iron solid raised to the power of the corresponding value of nu j which is minus 3. So, I have written minus 3 here and finally, I write down the contribution of the fourth component which is activity of water vapor raised to the power of the corresponding new value which is minus 4. So, this is writing down the equilibrium constant exactly following the definition in terms of the activity of each of the components present in the equilibrium chemical mixture. And therefore, I understand that here these activities that I am talking about, I am talking about their values at equilibrium. Now, if I go further, I can actually do some simplification over here. I can just rewrite the these two terms in the numerator and these two terms in the denominator. So, it takes up the form that we are most used to that is having the activities or the contributions from the uh, products in the numerator and the contribution of the reactants in the denominator. Now, going ahead we do use the definition of the standard state of a pure solid or a liquid. So, how does it help us? We know by convention that if you have a pure solid or liquid, then its activity is equal to 1. That helps us simplify our expression for k further and I say that okay, in this case, this is a pure solid phase. Therefore, I can put its activity equal to 1. Here I have another pure solid phase. So, I can all again put its activity equal to 1 and therefore, I find that the equilibrium constant for the reaction that I am studying now that now depends on the activity of hydrogen gas raised to the power of 4 divided by activity of water vapor raised to the power of 4. Now, if I am carrying out this reaction under conditions where the activity can be replaced by the corresponding concentration. So, can I replace the activity of the ith component or the jth component in the equilibrium reaction mixture? The answer is yes, I can and I can replace the activity A j either by its molality or by the molar concentration or if applicable if the jth component is a gas, I can replace it by its partial pressure. But as you understand that in each case, I must adopt a suitable scale as shown here in this chart. So, in my uh, reaction of interest, I find that I have, I am left with only the activity of the gases because these two terms are unity. 
and therefore, what I will do is I will write out the equilibrium constant in terms of partial pressure of partial uh, pressure of the hydrogen gas raised to the power of 4 divided by partial pressure of water vapor raised to the power of 4. So, this is the final simplified expression for the uh, equilibrium constant that you may use when you are performing an experiment and trying to determine the value of k by determining this partial pressures of the product and the reactant at equilibrium. Now, moving ahead, let me once again uh, go and try solving this very simple problem. Let me read out the problem for you. The equilibrium constant is found to be equal to 2.40 into 10 to the power minus 7 for the reaction that is so shown here. So, this is the gas phase dissociation of NOCl 2 moles of it into 2 moles of NO and 1 mole of chlorine gas. So, the question here is if you know the equilibrium constant of this reaction, can I estimate the equilibrium constant for the reaction where 1 mole of NO gas reacts with half mole of chlorine gas giving rise to 1 mole of NOCl gas. So, why is this uh, uh, problem interesting? As you see that I have given you the equilibrium constant for the reaction where NOCl dissociates and I want you to give me the equilibrium constant for the reaction where NOCl is being formed from NO and chlorine. So, how do I solve this? The way to solve this is for reaction 1, I write down the uh, definition of equilibrium constant in terms of the partial pressures of the components at equilibrium. So, here I identify that these are my products and this is my reactant. Therefore, K 1 would be given by partial pressure of nitric oxide raised to the power of 2 multiplied by partial pressure of chlorine divided by partial pressure of NOCl raised to the power of 2 and the reason why I can write it like this we have explained in the problem 1. Okay. Now, here it is given that the value of K 1 is 2.4 into 10 to the power minus 7. You can very easily ask me ma'am why is not there any unit for K 1? The answer is in each of these cases the partial pressures have been described in terms of P by P naught. So, the value that we are putting in here are dimensionless quantities and that is the reason why by definition K 1 does not have any dimension. Now, let us look at the second reaction. For the second reaction I can write down the equilibrium constant I denote it as K 2 and this obviously would be given by partial pressure of NOCl divided by partial pressure of NO into partial pressure of chlorine, but now this partial pressure would be raised to the power of half. I note immediately that I can write this as P square NOCl divided by P square NO PCl2 to the power of half. That is very easy algebra and immediately I can compare this relation to the expression for K 1 that I have and I can write down that K 2 is nothing but 1 by K 1 raised to the power of half. So, K 1 is square root of uh, K 2 is square root of K 1, but inverse of it. So, now I know that if I know the value of K 1, I can very easily find out the value of K 2. Let us now do this. 
So, when I evaluate this uh, uh, quantity, I just put back the value of k 1 here. So, this is 2.4 into 10 to the power of minus 7 and this is in the denominator. I evaluate this and take a square root of it and the result is 2.04 into 10 to the power of 3. So, now I know the equilibrium constant for the reaction that has been given to me. Now, moving over to a third problem which looks interesting because it is the conversion of graphite into diamond. Okay. So, we are uh, looking at the isothermal conversion of carbon in its uh, allotropic form of graphite into uh, carbon in its highly prized allotropic form diamond. And I am interested in carrying out this reaction at 298 Kelvin and I am trying to understand the nature of equilibrium that will exist between graphite and diamond at this temperature. Now, there are certain amount of data which are available to you from standard data table. I know that the standard gives free energies of formation of carbon in graphite form and diamond form are given over here. So, I find that when uh, the standard uh, gives free energy of formation of graphite is 0, 0.0 kilojoules per mole, that of carbon in its diamond form is plus 2.9 kilojoules per mole. I have also supplied you with an experimental observation that if this can be uh, carried out, if this uh, transition can be carried out and the equilibrium is reached, there would be a reduction in volume of carbon at equilibrium which is given by this value. Now, I am asking you that if I want to establish this chemical equilibrium at uh, a temperature of 298 Kelvin, what would be the pressure at which this equilibrium will be established. So, I understand that I need to find out the pressure at which this equilibrium will be established and therefore, I need to use all these data which are provided to me to find out the condition of equilibrium. Now, let us go ahead and look at the data and use them in a stepwise fashion. The first thing I know that from the given conditions, I understand that the standard uh, Gibbs free energy of reaction as given here that must be the standard Gibbs free energy of formation of diamond minus standard Gibbs free energy of formation of graphite. So, from the given data, I understand that this must be equal to plus 2.9 kilojoules per mole. Okay. Now, if with this uh, information at hand, I will go ahead and then try to understand something more. I would I know that for each allotrope of carbon for the isothermal change, I know that d g is equal to v d p because it is an isothermal change. If that happens, then I can integrate the uh, two sides of this equation and rewrite the expression that for the ith isotope, the Gibbs free energy uh, at a pressure p, this is going to be equal to the Gibbs free energy of the ith allotrope plus this integral which goes from the initial pressure to the final pressure here d p v i. Now, please remember that I am dealing with uh, solid uh, phases and therefore, I can very easily write that v i will not undergo any substantial change as I change the pressure from p naught to p. Therefore, I can take v i out of the integration and this would be the result. Therefore, I can go ahead and write down that what is going to be the uh, free energy of diamond at a pressure p that is going to be the standard free energy of diamond plus v d into 
P minus P naught, where V d is the volume of diamond, which remains constant over this entire range of pressure as I go from the standard pressure P naught to the desired pressure P. In a similar fashion, I can write down the free energy of graphite in terms of its at a pressure P in terms of its standard free energy plus the volume of graphite that remains more or less constant over the range of pressure varying from P naught to P. Now, if I just subtract this equation from this equation, then what do I get on the left hand side? On the left hand side, I will get G D P minus G G P. So, that is what I have written down here. So, what should I have on the right hand side? I should be having the difference between the first two terms which appear as G D naught minus G G naught plus I will have a difference between these two terms and these are nothing but V D minus V G. The difference in volume as the system goes from graphite to diamond multiplied by the change in pressure as I have uh, gone from the initial standard pressure to the final pressure P. Now, let us have a look at what we have got here. So, by expressing these uh, uh, equations, I understand G D P minus G G P. This is nothing but the free energy of reaction as the system goes from graphite to diamond at a pressure P. Similarly, I understand that the difference in the standard free energy of diamond and graphite that corresponds to the standard free energy of reaction. And in this case, what I can do is I can write down delta G reaction is equal to delta G reaction under standard condition plus this change in volume into P minus P naught. Now, that I have got all the information that I require, then what I will do is at equilibrium, I will note that delta G reaction that is the free energy of reaction must be equal to 0. So, I will exploit this fact and put delta G reaction in this expression equal to 0 and therefore, what I get is 0 is equal to the standard uh, Gibbs free energy of reaction plus V d minus V g into P minus P naught. I will rearrange this relationship and then I can write down that the pressure at which this condition will be valid can be expressed as P naught plus the standard Gibbs free energy of reaction divided by the change in volume as a uh, the result of the reaction. Now, delta V reaction is uh, V d minus V g. So, here I have changed the side. So, I have now delta V reaction with a negative sign. Okay, so, now we have all the information required to evaluate the equilibrium pressure and this is where I have put in all the values. P naught is 1 bar delta G naught reaction is 2.9 kilojoules per mole and the reduction in the volume as a result of the reaction is put in here. Now, comes the uh, problem that here the first term is expressed in bar and the second term is expressed in joules per meter cube. So, obviously, what we will have to do is we will have to do a conversion of units. So, let me remind you that 1 bar is 10 to the power of 5 Pascal and that is 10 to the power of 5 Newton per square meter that is 10 to the power of 5 joules per cubic meter. And therefore, I can say that this number that I have got must correspond to this number divided by uh, 10 to the power of 5 joules per cubic meter per bar. And 
the result that I get is this number which I can now use over here and write that this is 1 plus this 14077.67 bar. So, the final result that I get is 14078.67 bar. Now, as you see that the equilibrium pressure is very high. So, what we have obtained over here is this very large number and that tells me that I started off with this problem where I wanted to know the pressure that I need to apply on graphite at 298 Kelvin such that it gets converted to diamond and I find that the pressure is very high. In order to uh, uh, in order to put so much pressure, the kind of uh, experimental setup that you would require would be very, very uh, expensive. And therefore, although thermodynamics tells you that this is a feasible transformation, this is not commercially viable. We will see later on how one uh, acts upon predictions of thermodynamics and improves the uh, commercial viability of a reaction that is useful to human civilization. Thank you.